Today's webinar coordinator and moderator is David Lamb. David is the leader of the National Soil Health and Sustainability Team located here at the East National Technology Support Center in Greensboro. And with that, David, I'm going to turn the webinar over to you so you can introduce the topic and our presenter. Uh, thank you very much, Holly, and I want to send out a big welcome to everybody. And I want to apologize for my voice. I'm battling a cold, if you can believe that, in the middle of summer. And it's decided to settle in my uh, voice box there. So if I sound a little raspy, uh, it's just because that's just the way it is. I, I'm really excited about today's webinar. It's the last one in the Soil Health series. This will be the 10th one. And I think we saved the best one to last. Uh, I've got a, had an opportunity to hear Klaus speak as part of the Soil Renaissance uh, forum that was held earlier uh, in the summer, about mid-July. Uh, he hosted, or participated along with Dr. Honeycutt and a few other folks, and, and he'll explain more about that, what that is. But Klaus is a, is a farmer from uh, Pinion, uh, New York, and he farms with the Lakeview Organic Grains, and he's just a wealth of knowledge. And I I'm, I'm want to give you folks a head up. This is presentation. There are a lot of pictures, so don't miss out. There's not going to be a lot of written language in this one. You're going to have to listen and take notes because this gentleman has a lot to offer when he's talking about organic farming and building soil health. And pay attention because this is a rare opportunity. And, and I also want to give Klaus a big thank you to start off with. He had a group from Cornell out to his farm this morning. He's on the webinar with us this afternoon. I don't know when he time, finds time to farm the 1,400 acres he has there in New York. He must have it figured out. So, we got, Klaus, I appreciate your time, and I turn it over to you. I wish I had it figured out some days. <laughs> uh, tough thing about soil health, a lot like human health, we don't think about it except in the ab absence of it. And you know, really defining it makes uh, can uh, be a problem for us. But uh, I think the NRCS definition of soil health is a good one. Uh, we had a meeting where we discussed soil health and tried to define it for several hours, and went around in circles, and then came back to the NRCS one, so which I think it really is a test to how well thought out it was. I'd uh, right now I. I'm uh, almost afraid to quote it because I'll get it wrong, but it has to do with the, the ability of soils to function, you know, to do what we want them to do. And I would go a little further on this definition of soil health and say that uh, it is creating an environment in our fields, in our soil, that is suitable for the crop that we're trying to grow there. And just for an example on this, uh, if we were to grow, um, and I'm, I'm kind of muddying the waters, but if we were to want to grow a tree fruit crop, I would think that some of our parameters and some of our things that we're looking for in a soil to be healthy might be different than what they are in a row crop. But uh, be that as it may, a lot of the functions in soil health are going to be the same. The ability to uh, absorb water rapidly, the ability to hold water so that when there are periods of excessive, we can store it, and then when there are periods when we're not getting water that we can bring it back. The ability of a soil to uh, resist diseases. Those are all uh, key pieces of soil health. When I became interested in it, uh, it was right about when Cornell was starting their work, and we were noticing that yields of especially vegetable crops were dropping. And nobody could quite understand why. We had better fertilizers. We had better uh, pesticides. But for some reason, the, there was something pulling back the yields where they just weren't performing as well as they had before. And a group was called together. And I really want to give Cornell credit. It wasn't just a pathologist or just somebody who studied weeds, but they brought together what's known as a program work team, which represented almost all disciplines that have to do with agriculture. So that we were looking at the soil uh, from many aspects. And it's interesting, back when modern agricultural research started, um, of course, Eustace from Liebig started his uh, 
did his work on minerals from the soil going into plants, and he came up with the theory of the, the barrel with the shortest stave, you know, limiting what the, the yield is. But it's, it's really a lot more complicated than that. And when we do a soil test, we've gotten very good at doing chemical soil tests. But we may not be identifying what is our yield limiting factor. And yield is probably the simple one. If we're really looking at health, there are, there are other factors. So I'm going to take you on a thought, a thought process. I want everyone to think about what happens when you abandon a field, something that's been in um, row crops, intensively farmed. What happens the first year? And I would hazard that in most parts of the country, if it's been something that was in corn or soybeans, the, the first year when we abandon it, it is covered with broadleaf weeds, things like lamb's quarter, ragweed, red root pigweed, um, probably some velvet leaf. An interesting thing about these weeds, something like a, a pigweed or an amaranth can produce close to a million seeds. And when we come into the second year after a field that's been let go, we actually have many orders of magnitude more seeds laying on top of the same species that were there the year before. But in the second year after being abandoned, almost none of this grows. There's a different group of species. What has happened here is the environment and that soil has changed. And this takes me back around to the definition, uh, a more refined definition of soil health. And that is a, a healthy soil is providing an environment that uh, the species that we're growing is best suited in. That way the, the species we're growing ideally should be biologically better adapted for the environment that we, that we provided it than any of the other species. Now if we make the connection back to human health, if we're in an environment, you know, a person, where we have the right nutrition, we have the right temperature, we have what we need, we would expect to be healthy. And if we come into an environment where maybe it's too cold, too wet, uh, we're not adequately fed, we would expect to get sick. And I, I really think the analogy works very well here with soil. Now, when we uh, first started farming organically here in Penn Yen, uh, one of the big advantages that I found in organic farming was there were markets for almost anything we wanted to grow. Now, I had farmed conventionally for 20 years. And sad to say, quite often my profit was entirely in the subsidy money that I was getting, where I would plant a crop of corn knowing that it's not likely to be profitable. Prices were low, uh, inputs were fairly high, but we were getting enough subsidy to make up the difference. I also knew that if my corn followed, say, clover or alfalfa or some other legume crop, that it would take less inputs to produce a good yield and that I would almost always make more money. And this created a tension for me because the rotation crops didn't have a good market. Uh, once we went to organic farming, we found that we had markets for almost anything that we, would, we could grow. And that made it a lot easier to create a healthy rotation, um, especially things, the obvious things would be like northern corn rootworm, corn borer, uh, some of our weeds became easier to handle because of the way we uh, rotated. Also, we could grow our nitrogen and not need the off-farm inputs. But um, that wasn't really what we were thinking when we made our switch. That was just something we discovered. I, uh, when we first made the ch uh, transition to organic, it, it was entirely economically motivated. We weren't making a good living on our farm. Uh, at least we didn't think we were making as much as we wanted to. Uh, we had kids coming along, and we wanted to be able to send them to college and maintain a good standard of living. One day we saw an ad in the paper that was offering us, at that time, the astronomical price of $6 a bushel for wheat, which was roughly double the conventional price. And I went to our local experts, and they assured me that Organic farming was something that probably was appropriate for a small backyard plot or a market gardener, but totally impractical and uh, undoable on the scale that we were talking about it. And I said that was all the encouragement I needed. 
<laughs> to at least try it. But we did a lot, all the calculations of how much yield we could lose and uh, you know, how we were going to come out of this if the, if the experiment failed. So we definitely uh, laid our plans for what if we make a big mistake here. But what we also did was went to Cornell and studied the Mann Library. And, we, and when we uh, went there, we were looking for two major things. We were looking for what machinery or other things we could substitute for the herbicides we'd been using and how we were going to be able to provide the fertilizer, or something to substitute for the fertilizer we'd been using. And I know now that those were exactly the wrong questions. Uh, you can farm organically that way, but it's really farming conventionally with organic inputs, and it seldom is very satisfactory. Uh, it's, it's not a successful way to farm. It doesn't produce good yields, and it certainly doesn't produce good profits. But what I found that was unexpected when I was doing my search in the library was a professor. Uh, he'd been a, the guru of weeds in Germany. He was credited with being one of the first people to do experiments with herbicides. And in his writings, there was a concept that kind of turned my thinking upside down. And I'll share a quote with everyone. Uh, what he wrote was that every crop should follow its most suitable predecessor so that the vigor of the crop alone will check the growth in weeds. Now, that was, that was a bit of a surprise to me, but it, it kind of made sense. Another thing that he wrote was that cultural practices form the basis of all weed control, while the various other means should be seen as auxiliary only. Now, these, these were interesting statements coming from the guy who was pioneering using herbicides. And they raised more questions in my mind than they did uh, answers. But in finding the answers, I learned some things that made a lot of sense to me when I uh, thought about them out in the field. Uh, one is a concept back to when we talked about abandoning a field, and you have the first year all broadleafs or annual type weeds that make a lot of seed, and the second year almost none of those weeds but a different group. And if you waited a third year, we would start going into Oh, more perennials, uh, goldenrod, uh, some of these abandoned cropland weeds. And then if we waited a little longer, we'd start seeing brambles and woody plants, and then the beginnings of trees, and we would have a succession of species. What Dr. Laudemacher was writing about was essentially creating an environment in our field that gave us a natural succession that uh, was providing the right environment for the crop that we were going to grow. And the concept really made sense to me from a yield standpoint, too, because if the uh, environment in the field makes our crop be the favored species, it would have advantages over everything else. And if we go back to our analogy to human health, you know, if we're in an environment that's not favorable to us, we get sick. Well, if a crop's in an environment that's not favorable to it, it gets plant disease, it will, you'll start seeing insects. Um, you definitely are going to have more weeds because the crop's not as vigorous or as competitive. And it, it really does help hold uh, with that analogy. In addition to these, these things, there's uh, back to what a crop needs. And I'm, I'm going to skip here to match the slide. At Cornell University, after we'd been farming organically for some time and had uh, very good results, and I, I'm fast forwarding here, we were uh, pleasantly surprised with how quickly we learned how to make the system work for us. And we started with a rotation that I was somewhat familiar with already, and that would be a, small, a winter small grain that was frost seeded to a legume, which in our case the most successful legume was medium red clover. The next spring that would be turned, turned under to grow a crop of corn. That corn would be followed by either soybeans or dry beans or some other, uh, or small grain, or a spring small grain, something that had a lower nitrogen requirement. 
and that spring small grain or soybeans would be followed by a winter small grain, which would then again be underseeded to clover and come back to corn. Now that's that's an oversimplified version of the rotation because there, there's all kinds of branches and options that we could have that we could add to that. But uh, our our search for what do we do about replacing the fertility, uh, we had to find manure. Now, dairy manure will not meet the needs of a, uh, a heavy corn crop unless we're putting on some really high rates. And if we're having to import the manure because we had no animals on our farm, uh, the freight would become pretty burdensome. So we settled on poultry manure. And we did our uh, first couple of years just kind of by guess. And I wanted to know why, or I wanted to know how much we should be using. I wanted to know, I wanted to do some research or see some research that would tell us what is the optimum amount to use. And to do that, I wrote a research proposal and submitted it to an organic funder who promptly turned it down. They didn't like it. And I had a friend at Cornell who said, can I use this? And he turned it into another organization, actually a conventional organization, and they funded it for five times what I had originally asked for. And we set up a randomized uh, block where we did, uh, we used GPS to map out a 20 acre field, and we did a, a random block of many different rates uh, using poultry litter. And we did use our basic rotation so that the nitrogen for the corn part of the system would be also supplemented by nitrogen from the legume. And we used, uh, for our 1x rate, essentially what a conventional consultant would have recommended for a field with that soil test. And we decided to do zero, half of that, and then we doubled it. And I think we went as high as uh, six, well, four times or whatever. It was a, a high multiple above what would have been used. And under a normal conventional uh, system, we went ran this for five years and analyzed through the rotation cycle uh, where we were going to get the where we got the best yield. We had used the yield monitor on a combine, but we didn't just look at yield. We also had our weed ecologist from Cornell, Chuck Moeller, would come out and analyze the weed growth. We did soil health analysis. Uh, Carol McNeil, who's our extension specialist, was, came out and studied uh, what, if, what impacts or differences we might have seen in the soil. We tried to look at it from a multidisciplinary approach, everything that we could learn from this. And what we learned was quite interesting. Uh, from an NP and K standpoint, or at least for a P and K standpoint, uh, we showed that the conventional yield response curves were the same as the organic ones that when we put on poultry litter, uh, we could find our top yield at just about the same place where if we were using other sources of that phosphorus and potash, which was a really an important thing to learn because it told us we could rely on some of, this, some of these uh, pieces of research that had been pretty well done and established from the beginning. We did learn something surprising. And that was that we were almost never short of nitrogen. Now, we, we thought nitrogen was going to be a big challenge. But what the research we did in that field, and then later Cornell University did a systems trial where there was a conversion between a regular, on a, on a good upstate New York soil type, uh, they, from conventional farming into organic, they followed essentially what was the what were standard practices on a large number of successful organic farms. And, they, and that research backed up the same finding, that nitrogen was almost never a yield limiting factor. Even if we only had a poor cover crop of medium red clover, uh, we were growing more than ample nitrogen to make maximum yield in our crop. And I think that's really significant. And it, should be pointing out not just for organic farmers, but for other farmers, that where we're relying on imported manure for nitrogen, we are probably causing ourselves some problems. Uh, in this trial on our farm, 
we saw that yield uh, of weeds <laughs> never topped out, even at six times the rate where we had the top yield of corn, we were still getting an increase in weed pressure. And the way we were measuring the weed pressure was going out and weighing the weed biomass. And I, I think that was pretty significant. Uh, we've also found that the time of year when we put the manure on had an impact on weed pressure, where if we put the manure on an actively growing cover crop the season before, it not only was better for the environment, but it also gave us a lot less weed pressure in the crop. And uh, from that, I, I, would wi I wish more farmers had paid attention to that because there are so many farmers who are applying manure hugely in excess of where they're getting maximum benefit from it. And th this is again, based on uh, research that is pretty well documented and was done uh, under the discipline of uh, university trials. Klaus, can, can yeah. I ask you, I need to clarify this. So you're saying that where you put the manure on at a ton and a half to the acre, you maxed out your yield, but yeah. when the excess, you all you did was raise more weeds? Is that basically what you were saying? That's exactly right. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up to strengthen that point because I, I really, uh, we were surprised. And we thought we could push the fertility and push our yields, but all we did was push the yields of the weeds. And it was not just the number of weeds that sprouted. And, and incidentally, these weeds were not in the manure. This manure was carefully heated to make sure that you know, we weren't importing weeds. But it, uh, it had a biological effect that increased the germination of weed seeds in the soil and also increased their growth. So. Uh, and uh, the time of year makes sense when we think about it now, where it was going on to an actively growing cover crop. Whatever it was in the manure that was stimulating the weeds was being taken up by the cover crop and then returned slowly the next year to the crop. Where when we put it on in the spring, it was there to feed the weeds right off the bat. So I, I think that's a really significant finding. Now, this might look like an odd picture that I just brought up for a soil health discussion. But it brings a point in what we're plowing down. And I, I think for a lot of us, we think soil test and we think NP and K and trace elements. But how often do we really think about what's in that green matter that's being returned to the soil? And I did these calculations based on actual uh, tests that were done on our farm. And this crop that's, plow that's being plowed here was roughly three tons of dry matter. We were turning in 240 pounds of N, 30 pounds of P2O5, and 120 pounds of K2O. Now, that was not showing in the soil test. That was cycling through the cover crop. And I believe we are not even scratching the surface with cover crops as to what they can do for us in terms of being a nutrient sink, and, and this is like in the fall and through the winter when we've got rain and uh, leaching conditions, these crops are actively growing and taking up those minerals. They're adding carbon to the minerals. And what I think is underestimated or underappreciated is that these cover crops also provide food for our microbes. You think about the this three tons in the spring, there, there were an, an additional four ton the fall before that were turned under after a small grain crop. And I still remember my uh, the guy who was running that tractor saying, what are we going to do with this mess? We can't get rid of this cover crop is nothing but a problem because we're not going to be able to handle it with our machinery. When spring came, the ground was virtually bare. And if you look closely, you could see earthworm castings all over the place. This stuff was earthworm pasture. And we had, even with plowing, which I know the plow is supposed to destroy organic matter and it's supposed to destroy earthworms, but we have at least two orders of magnitude more earthworms than I've ever seen on, a, on the farm before. And it's because of the amount of food we were putting down. I'd like to upset both conventional and organic farmers at uh, some of the talks I do where I 
I asked, how many of you think the chemicals that we're using are killing the earthworms? And, of course, all the organic farmers say, yeah, that's what's doing it, that's what's doing it. And then I asked, well, how many of you think it's the tillage that's killing all the earthworm? And another group of farmers would be yelling, yeah, that's the tillage that's killing the earthworms. And I'd say, you're both wrong. It's starvation. Now, how fast, how well are your cattle going to grow if they lived on a diet of old dead crop residue? You know, there's no protein there, there's, or there, there's very little protein, there's very little energy, there isn't much in the way of minerals. How could we claim to try to, how could we claim to be producing uh, increases in earthworm populations if we're starving them to death? You know, and this is regardless of what kind of tillage we're doing, regardless of what kind of chemicals we're doing, if we want to have a lot of life in the soil, we have to feed it. And I think that's a really important factor all the way through. Uh, I've had the picture of the plow here for another reason. The you know, plow has been blamed for a lot of damage, and it's been responsible for a lot of damage to soil. Uh, I wish the resolution was a little better here, but you notice we're plowing quite shallow, and there's a little bit of green sticking up. Uh, when I was in high school, I had a really great teacher who used to say, he used to be bothered as we got bigger and bigger tractors and the boys in the coffee shop loved to talk about how clean they were plowing and how deep they were plowing and how nice it looked when they were done, think about where does the fence post route off? Generally in the top four inches. Why would we want to turn all of our organic matter down 10 inches deep and what's worse, even flip it and create a, a layer so that it's all buried that deep? It's in a zone that's anaerobic. It's in a zone where there's relatively little activity, it's also being placed in a, down so far that it's not doing us any good. Uh, when we plow it back up a year later, that would tell me that it's not gone through an aerobic breakdown, much more likely in those anaerobic conditions. We get uh, biology that makes methane, makes CO2, makes ethylene. Now the products of this organic matter, if it's turned down deep, are not things that are desirable. And I, I really think the damage that the plow has done to the soil has really increased tremendously since we've gotten big horsepower tractors and plows that are able to go really deep. If you go down to Lancaster and see where the Amish are plowing, uh, I didn't see very many furrows there that were more, four, more than four or five inches deep. And the organic material is kind of mixed with this, into that zone when they turn. And that's the way everybody did it for years. But in recent years, I see a progression, and I'd, I'd like to call this the coffee shop progression, where everybody is showing off how much black smoke they can blow and how deep they can plow and how cleanly they can flip it. And then the next thing, you see the plow parked, and they're using a chisel plow because their yields went down or because their soil has been damaged. And I think it's because we're making very poor use. First of all, we're not putting enough organic matter down. We're not using cover crops on anywhere near enough farms, but even when we do, we're putting them into the soil in a way that they're not giving us a lot of benefit. So that's my little soapbox. Well, Ralph, uh, can yes. I ask a couple, I had a couple questions come in sure. here. About, <clears throat> they were wondering about, you know, you're talking about that nutrient content. When is that going to come available as far as the crop growth of, say, you're following out with the corn or the preceding or the next uh, that's a really good question. The rule of thumb with the nitrogen is that half of it will come available during the crop year, but it's, uh, that's only part of the answer. Of course, that'd be 120 pounds of N, but there was the, there's also the nitrogen, the root nodules left in the ground, and there's a nitrogen from the fall before, and Cornell has done some really interesting studies on our farm studying nitrogen fixation. And we're finding legumes are like people. They tend, they're basically lazy and only work as hard as they have to. So in these systems where there's a lot of nitrogen, the legumes really are fixing less, and we're, we're actually recycling some of the same end over and over. And that's been done by tagging, you know, like with a, with a nitrogen isotope and actually following it through the cycle. But what we're finding is that up to the level where we got optimum yield, we seem to be in good shape. And uh, the bigger problem is if we can't time the mineralization of that nitrogen correctly. 
you know, it's a little bit like the cavalry came there after the Indians got done. If the nitrogen comes, you know, comes available late, and the crop needs it up front, and then the nitrogen is made available after the crop needed it, all it's going to do is make weeds grow. So that is one of the reasons that organic farmers um, rely on tillage more, is because it, whether we realize it or not, is timing the mineralization of that organic material. I don't know if I answered that question completely. No, I think that's good. Then I had another question. Do you think you would achieve these kind of nutrient cycling benefits if you would just uh, not plow that under uh, and let that cover crop, say, roll it or something like that, just knocked it down? The question is, could we do this without plowing? Yes, we definitely could get the nutrient balance, but I'm not sure. It, depending on where you are in the country, like in the north, it's quite cool in the spring. We would it would come slower. So while we would have the same amount of nitrogen, there are some environments where uh, leaving it on top would make it mineralize more slowly and come at a later point than where we really wanted it. And I think that's why, especially in the northern areas, no-till quite often is accompanied by some extra nitrogen. But uh, so it, it's it's a, it depends answer actually there there would all of this nitrogen would cycle it just may not cycle exactly when we want it to and that's a place where maybe we need to be looking at the species the nitrogen in clover is tied up with a fair amount of carbon uh, we did some experiments where we used Austrian winter peas which had a huge amount of nitrogen and I know Rodale has the Rodale Institute has done some research where they used hairy vetch and rolled it. And they found that by delaying the corn planting date slightly and then rolling these legumes that break down a little faster, they were able to time the mineralization with the needs of the crop and have no yield drop. So again, this, this is a really important question because it has to do with not just quantity, but also the timing of when it comes available. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions in this area or? Well, no, I think you kind of summarized those good, so, but the key, okay. the key is timing, I think is what I'm hearing from you. Yes, and it, and that kind of makes sense, Simon, I mean, when we're using, when we learn to use the side dress nitrogen, the reason we're side dressing is we're, we're timing its application with the needs of the crop, and we're also trying to uh, avoid losses. We're trying to avoid having leaching or tie-ups that we sometimes get on cool ground, which protects water quality, but protects our wallets, too, so that we're not buying extra just for what's going to be lost. Okay, let me, one more quick question, and I'll let you continue. Sure. How long, you talked about this successional uh, moving from where you were to where you are now, and then you jumped into this manure thing. How long do you think it took you before you started to reap some of the benefits of this increased in soil health and the nutrient cycling is basically what you've been talking about? Yeah, this, this was a really good question. It depended on what crop order we used. We found that if we were trying to move into corn, we lost money for, it took about five or six years before things worked if we started with corn as our first crop after getting off the synthetic fertilizers. When our first crop was soybeans, we would actually have a, a full crop the first year with soybeans. They're very efficient feeders. Then we would have a yield depression in the second year when we followed them with the grain and then after we had the clover plowed down, we would be, uh, the system wouldn't be up to speed, but it was up to speed enough to grow uh, a crop of a uh, heavy nitrogen using crop with no yield depression. So in that, in that system, it took us about three years. But if we started with the wrong crop, it could take five or six years and it, there would be a lot of red ink between when you started and when you finally got it running. So again, this, this has to do with, uh, order of plants, order of crops, and uh, has to do with using our heads and using the information that's available to us. And a lot of, uh, a lot of farmers, especially when we first started, lost a lot of money trying to grow a, a heavy nitrogen using crop like corn before their land was ready for it. And that, uh, that leads to, that creates an environment that's really not good for corn and it makes for some pretty sick corn. So this picture probably looks familiar to a lot of people. If we could pan over to the left, there would be a whole row of silos. Uh, 
This was the field that always got the manure. It was our neighbor's field. Uh, he keeps telling me, I wish you'd quit using that picture and use one of your own fields. But uh, what's growing in this field is lamb's quarter, pigweed, and velvet leaf. And in this particular uh, case, they were about six feet tall. The corn soybeans were four feet tall. And this was a case of making an environment where these weeds were better adapted. Even though the soybeans were doing great, the weeds were doing better. And the reason I mentioned the silos is there's something about these weeds that kind of gives us some hints as to what's happening underground. These are non-mycorrhizal weeds. And ties it, we're tying back to the soil test work. We saw an increase in weeds when we used more manure than where our optimum yields came on the crop. Well, we're way past that point in this field. And incidentally, this field had been cultivated fairly well, too. These, these are just the weeds that were in the row. Uh, what, what's interesting about these weeds is that non-mycorrhizal plants really thrive where phosphorus levels are high. In fact, uh, very high phosphorus inhibits mycorrhizae. Most of our crops have uh, mycorrhizal root systems. And what mycorrhizae are is a fungus that's in the soil that actually helps the plant access water, but more importantly, phosphorus. It becomes, in effect, an extension of the plant root system. And it goes out and explores a lot more of the soil than the, the crop root itself would. And in the process, uh, feeds the crop these minerals that are hard to find. Now, the crop, on the other hand, is producing a lot more energy than what we see, what we harvest. And some studies, I've seen up to 50% of some plants' energy production from photosynthesis is given off in the form of root exudates, which are very high uh, sugar, high in minerals, high in protein, uh, very high quality food that the plants are giving off and feeding things like the mycorrhizae and other, uh, you know, probably millions of other species that grow around the plant's roots. If we look at what's going on here, it's the crop is actually um, farming microbes around its roots. There's a symbiosis going on here, you know, which while it's below ground and we don't see it, we see the effects of it above ground. And this is one of the drivers of soil health is what kind of an ecosystem do we have underground. So back to this picture, the crop is not getting its normal advantage here. In fact, uh, I've seen some research that hinted that these mycorrhizal fungi, in return for the sugars they get from the plants, not only help the plant get phosphorus, but they also inhibit the growth of non-mycorrhizal other plants that are non-mycorrhizal, ones like the lamb's quarter and the pigweed. But when we've applied so much manure and over-fertilized to the point where the soil is hostile to the mycorrhizae, it gives these non-mycorrhizal plants a large biological advantage over our crop. And at that point, uh, we can hide that by using an herbicide to, to kill the plants that are better adapted and allow our crop to survive. Or in the case of an organic farmer like I was, we stand there and wonder, how are we going to survive this, and how are we going to control these plants? Now, I don't know about the rest of you. We've, I'm sure you've, we've all seen palmer amaranth that got kind of tall, and um, velvet leaf used to be the bane of my farm when we converted to organic at first. Velvet leaf was, by midsummer, would be so big that you could hardly pull it out of the ground. In fact, you had to be pretty rugged, and the ground had to be a little damp to pull out a velvet leaf by the roots, and they were commonly 12 feet tall. <clears throat> I noticed something after we changed our farming system. We started cover cropping every, every chance we had as part of our organic system. Uh, we added more diversity. Uh, we were growing small grains and not, selling the, not removing the straw, but leaving it out there as a soil amendment. Uh, after about five years of this, the velvet leaf started showing some yellowing. And I think the picture on the left, you can see on the foreground, that velvet leaf is, those leaves aren't, while the plant's doing fine, those leaves aren't quite 100%. The picture on the right was taken in a field that had been in where an old barnyard was. And the first two years I farmed it, 
organically without herbicides. I just mowed it down, the velvet leaf had taken over. But after, over time, and this was using the cover crops and using a more diverse rotation, uh, the velvet leaf got, didn't get as tall anymore. And then we started noticing midsummer, the leaves turned yellow, like, like the ones on the left, but more profound. And then after, uh, after a while, they would turn black and they'd fall off. In the picture on the right, that velvet leaf is just a hair over four feet tall. And it died before the summer was over. It made no viable seeds. Uh, all the leaves came off. And we found, we, we actually asked one of our friends at Cornell to tell us what was going on. And he found uh, velvet leaf anthracnose was the actual cause of death. Uh, it's very closely related to tomato anthracnose. This particular race has no effect on tomatoes. But it will kill velvet leaf, hollyhocks, and mallows, which I guess none of which I uh, feel a whole lot of sympathy for. So I thought this was great. This, this ought to be the answer to organic. We can grind this stuff up and spray the spores on the field. And in my uh, research, I found that there had been at least one or two attempts uh, at producing a spray made of this. The problem is uh, if you put it on a place, you wouldn't have repeat sales because if the disease took hold the next year, it would still be there and it would uh, still kill the crop. The bigger problem was, and this was what was pointed out at our friend from Cornell who identified the disease, was that he wanted to know why it was killing our velvet leaf. And on other farms where the velvet leaf seemed to be doing better, the velvet leaf would show signs of the disease and grow out of it, kind of like in the picture on the left where, yeah, it's got some sick leaves, but the plants overall is still doing fine. And I think he was asking the right questions. He said, what, you know, why does your velvet leaf die from it? And this goes back to the idea of the environment. Uh, the environment in the field, when we first converted, made velvet leaf the best adapted species, or at least one of the best adapted species. As the soil changed, the rotation was different, the inputs were different, the environment in that soil was changing for, uh, in some profound ways. We couldn't always see it, but we could see the effect. Uh, there wasn't just one disease in this velvet leaf. What we found out later was that the early yellowing was caused by a virus called Albutian yellows, which was vectored by white flies. And we had an interesting field day on our farm about 15 years ago where we were, uh, the purpose was to show people cultivation equipment and how to use it. But everybody was clustered around these velvet leaf plants. This was in a severe drought. It was about 100 degrees outside. And they were covered with white flies. And yet the crop didn't have a bug on it. And I think this showed us that because the plant was unhealthy, the insects were moving in and attacking the unhealthy plant. And in the process of sucking juice out of those plants, they were vectoring in the, the virus, the Albutian yellows. And all of those factors together left that plant so uh, compromised that when the anthracnose came, it killed it. You could bend over and pull these, these four-foot velvet leaf plants out of the ground. They didn't really have that big of roots. And the plant in the foreground is a lamb's quarter. That's another mycorrhizal plant, or non-mycorrhizal plant. And it, too, in that environment, wasn't doing so well. So somehow, over several years, the environment in that soil changed to f back to favoring mycorrhizal plants over the non-mycorrhizal plants. And I think that carries, kind of, carries an important lesson uh, for us, that every plant that grows in the soil changes that soil. And those changes make the soil the best environment for something else back to our succession of species. And every plant seems to have niches that it wants to fill. I'd be really curious to understand the biological triggers that make the plant know, you know, why don't spring plants sprout in the fall? Why don't fall biennials sprout in the spring? At least most of them don't. There, seems to, there seem to be biological cues in these plants that either tell them to sprout now conditions are right and you can grow, or maybe you better wait for a better chance to grow coming down the road. If we could understand those uh, signals, 
it would make farming a lot easier for us. Now, the reason I use this picture was the field on the left was just drilled organic soybeans. There was, they were double cropped, but there was no, virtually no weeds there. And we had a couple of years when I it got really late and your heaviest weed pressure tends to be the end of May. Uh, generally by, the early, by early June, you have a little less emergence. When you get to late June, uh, you really have a greatly reduced emergence of those early spring weeds. And a crop like soybeans uh, has a com actually gets a competitive advantage then uh, just by the time of year. I learned something really interesting by growing these soybeans, when you plant them late like that, it's too late to be planning coming back in and planting a winter grain on time. Because while the soybeans are still ripe relatively early, you know, ripe according to what their group is, but you, you lose just enough time in these northern climates that it's really too late to be planting wheat. And we did an experiment there. We threw on uh, no-till, spelt, wheat, tree decal, just drove through the field. I, one time I hired an airplane, and we found there's a window. Uh, we, I call it yellow leaf. It's when about the time you see the first yellow leaf, you can do it. When we tried doing it earlier than that, it actually was killed. It was smothered. I think there was too much shade, too much competition. But what I saw happening was that if we hit that window just right, the winter grain would take off and get a really good start. If I waited too long after that, uh, yeah, the winter grain would start, it would, but it just didn't seem to get the same kind of a, a takeoff. My guess of what's happening uh, is that we've had a succession there where there was a living root system from the soybeans. And again, take this as a guess, but I think it's a pretty educated guess. And that when we no-tilled by broadcasting the winter grain uh, into this system where there was a living rhizosphere, and all these functions were actively going on in the soil, they were uh, providing the services to the plant roots of the cover of the grain crop that tillage would have provided if we had waited longer. The good news is uh, by the time we combined those soybeans, we already had a four inch tall, well-established crop of grain in them. And it was it's certain, it's also a whole lot cheaper to just throw that seed on top of the ground than to work the ground up and um, try to establish, a, you know, do use conventional tillage to establish a grain crop in the fall. And I'm going to digress here a little bit. Uh, a few more thoughts on tillage. I think the reason, you know, farmers aren't stupid. Uh, the reason the plow has so much widespread use, especially before they built the plows bigger and deeper and started doing the wrong thing with them was it, that it worked, that it did result in higher yields. And I think it was the timing of the nitrogen, but also it helped destroy organic matter. Now, when you burn organic matter, you're making fertility available to the next crop. And farmers observed that when you did this, it cycled the nutrients faster, and your next crop grew better. The problem came when they did it too much, and they were extracting more every year than they were putting back. Remember, a lot of these systems didn't have cover crops in them, and a lot of them didn't have a lot of animals. So this continual plowing was like constantly drawing money out of the bank without putting as much as the interest back in. And you ended up depleting the organic matter. Uh, I think we could go the opposite extreme. And I've seen that in New York. I've been asked to consult on some fields that had been in hay for 50 years. And they'd just been hayed. Nobody put any fertilizer on them. they just got mowed. And year after year, these fields got weaker. Uh, some of the organic matters in those fields were 5 to 8%. And farmers were asking, well, I've got so much organic matter. How come nothing wants to grow here? Well, it's because we had pulled our phosphorus and potassium and our nitrogen down so far that the microbes were even starving to death in this ground. We had, we had robbed it. Uh, that organic matter was very much like if you had a millionaire starving to death because he wouldn't take any money out of the bank and use it. I think when we're, we need to talk about managing organic matter, I think a good goal is to always put a little more back than what we burn up or a little more back than what we're using. But there is nothing wrong 
with using organic matter. We want to have a healthy, active uh, soil life. Uh, and if we're going to have soil life, it has to be fed. It has to eat something. And that something is organic material. The, the problem comes is when we're consuming more than what we're using. I also think there's quite a lot of research available, especially older research, that indicates using synthetic nitrogen can create a very similar situation to what overusing tillage can use, can cause, that results in a continuing decline in organic matter. And I remember talking with Dr. Rakowski about some of the long-term no-till trials. And these were trials, with, I, I'm pretty sure, without cover crops where they were disappointed not to see organic matter go up. Actually, it went down. It went down slower than where tillage was used, but it still went down. And uh, I remember him mentioning that he was going back to the data from the Moro plots, which had early on indicated that the use of synthetic nitrogen without, uh, organic, without enough organic material to feed that microbial uh, bloom that comes when you put it on uh, was depleting organic matter. So it's just. Uh, just some observations that I've got and some speculation. But I really like these. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I was going to ask a couple questions when you're done there. <clears throat> and I know you got some other things. Real quick, uh, you know, related to that, do you think the timing, you know, because we did go from uh, plowing in the spring to plowing in the fall, and as far as nitrogen cycling and all that, you comment on that. Uh, oh, that's important. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, fall plowing, talk about drawing, uh, you know, whenever we do tillage, it's like drawing money out of the bank. But if we're doing it in the fall and the crop won't be planted till next spring, we've had time for that nitrogen to lay there, mineralize, and be leached away where it doesn't do us any good at all. It's just damaging the water. So when the, you know, when the plow is used at the wrong time of year, and I understand some soils are, you know, high in clay and uh, they need to be fall plowed, quote unquote, to, because of the structure, you know, the physical uh, nature of them. We're getting a big loss in organic matter with no offsetting benefit, and I, I think that's that's a major expense. I think we need to look at any kind of tillage as an expense. It's an, it's an expense in terms of the fuel that we're using, but it's an expense and it's a withdrawal from the organic matter bank account that's in our soil which it's OK to make the withdrawal if you're investing it in something that gives you more back. But if we're just in withdrawing it and not getting a return from it, it's destroying our capital. I don't know if I digress too far there. but No, no, that's good. OK. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about one other experience we had regarding soil health. And this, this was one where soil health testing paid off for us in a big way. It more than doubled our yields. We were growing edible dry beans. And when we first converted to organic, it was almost like printing your own money. We had better yields than the conventional farmers. And <laughs> we were getting a sky-high price for them. This was before the Chinese were dumping theirs on the market. And uh, they grew great. The second time we'd grow them, and, I, and the, all the old farmers said, you need to grow them about once every seven years or five years at the soonest. So we'd wait our minimum amount of time and go back and plant them again. The next time they didn't grow quite as good. Figured, well, maybe we did something wrong this year, or maybe it was the weather. By the third time around on some of these fields, we had heavy root rot. We had very poor production. Uh, we had no resilience when the weather turned bad. They just uh, they just fell apart when we had too much rain. And we just didn't know what was going on. Uh, Professor uh, Georgia Bowie at Cornell was studying this problem. And these roots were just covered with nematodes, a lot of damage, a lot of abrasion, and then pythium, rhizoctonia, fusarium would move in and literally would destroy the root systems. George did what I consider really brilliant research in the greenhouse. He would take a variety of Phaseolus vulgaris, you know, dry beans, that was known to be very susceptible. And he would take a sample from dozens and dozens of fields and plant those samples out in the greenhouse where he controlled the conditions and put these susceptible beans in them and grow them out. And he would grow them to a point where, I don't know how many leaves they had, but it was relatively early. And he would wash the soil off and do a root rating. And he could predict 
the first thing he used this for, he could predict very accurately whether it was a good bet to plant phaseolus, which at that time edible dry beans were a big crop in New York, and so were snap beans. They're both the same species. And he had a very good handle on whether your field was likely to be profitable, if that's what you grew, and at whether you're going to have root rot and how much. And he scored it on 1 to 5. But then he did something that I consider uh, a stroke of genius. He started asking, what would happen if we had a different crop preceding the bean crop? What effect would that have on our disease level in the soil? And he tried all kinds of different crops. I saw the research once. He must have tested 50 or 60 different crops. And what he would do is uh, get a reading on how, uh, a root rot reading, and then plant the crop on the soil, and then get a root rot reading. And he found some species that you planted in between, even though it wasn't the, the beans, made the root rot reading worse. Some species were neutral. Some gave you a small improvement, and some gave a huge improvement. There were two species in there in particular that gave huge improvements in root rot scores. They actually, uh, and what we know now, they were destroying the nematodes and the root rots both. Yellow mustard was one. I know Michigan State's done a lot of work on yellow mustard, where just a 60-day crop or 45, depending on the time of year, 45 to 60 days, short-term cover crop of yellow mustard, when that was turned into the soil, uh, it would, there's an enzyme in the yellow mustard. There, there's a compound in it called glucosinolate, which is when you put mustard on your hot dog, that's what makes it sharp. But there's an enzyme in the same leaf. And this is the story that uh, Dr. Honeycutt talked about at the Soil Renaissance press conference. Uh, that enzyme makes the glucosinolate turn into isocyanide, or isocyanate, which is a gas. By turning in a crop of yellow mustard, we were fumigating our fields. It's actually a biofumigation. Uh, another crop you can do that with is uh, soil. <coughs> And a lot of farmers who were onion farmers and were really suffering from nematode problems near us that were on muck learned that they could actually afford to give up one year of cropping and plant a crop with sorghum and turn it in just for that fumigation effect because of how it would clean up the, the nematode problem and the onions would grow so much better afterward. But in our case, yellow mustard was indicated. Uh, there was one other cover crop that really um, improved root, rot, root health ratings, and that was buckwheat. But in our case, George recommended we try to find a way to grow yellow mustard before planting dry beans. And the window that we tried was after a, after a crop of field corn. Now, in our area, the, we have to use every bit of season we have to get the corn ripe. And if we have good corn, it's really hard to get anything to grow in it that amounts to anything because it's so competitive. But there's a period when we're not using the land very well, and that's from about early March until we plant the dry beans, which could, can be as much as three months. And yellow mustard is very frost tolerant, and there are varieties that are the culinary varieties that have no hard seed. That means they don't lay there and become weeds in the sense that most weeds have some seeds that come right away and some that lay there until the conditions are right, and some of those are called hard seed. Well, yellow mustard has been bred to um, not have the hard seeds, and we started broadcasting about eight pounds per acre of yellow mustard seed in March into our corn stalks. And the first thing we found was that the yellow mustard really likes a little more nitrogen. That is one place where it would pay to put on some chicken manure or some dairy manure because the brassicas are heavy feeders, and that time of year when it's cool, there's not a lot of fertility. So that, that's just that's, that's a point aside. But George also said when you're spreading this, now leave some fields, leave some strips in fields or leave something half a field because I want to see what effect you're having. So we started growing these yellow mustard cover crops, which incidentally now we try to cover every field of corn with yellow mustard um, before 
the next crop. And he found that if you had a root rot, whatever the root rot rating was, it improved by one. So on a scale of one to five, where five is all dead and one is zero disease, if you read two and you and grew a crop of yellow mustard, it would move you to one. Or if you read four, it would move you to a three. Now that's a substantial improvement in root health just for growing a crop that we've no-tilled in. And uh, I love frost seeding or spinning crops on. It's the cheapest form of no-till there is because you don't have to buy expensive equipment. But that uh, was a major change for us. We started seeing our root health improve. Then we decided to try to add buckwheat, which had a completely different mode of action. You know, the yellow mustard we understand, and so sorghum would be the same way, that these are crops that produce the glucosinolate and it turns into isocyanate and it fumigates the soil, which incidentally when Michigan State studied it, while it's a fumigant, it seemed to be selective. It seemed to go do a lot more damage to the pathogens than it did to the beneficials, which is a, we don't know why, but it's a lot better uh, job of selecting to kill what you don't want and not kill everything. But the buckwheat, we found, has an organism that grows around its root system that produces chitinase. Chitinase is an enzyme that breaks down the cell wall of fungi. And and buckwheat was equally devastating to the root rot organisms that were in the soil. So we brought buckwheat in after a spring, after a winter grain harvest. So that for instance, after malting barley, if we had season enough, we'd grow dry beans. Malting barley also improved, or barley uh, as a crop, as long as it wasn't under seed of the legume, would improve the root rot ratings. But if it was too dry to grow dry beans, we would plant buckwheat. So on our farm then, we had, in a, in a typical rotation cycle, we'd have a crop of mustard and a crop of buckwheat before we uh, came back to dry beans. And we not only brought our yields of dry beans back up to what they uh, had been before we started having the root rot problems, we actually went beyond there. And of course, it's one of those years you brag about for the for probably half of your life before you have another one like that, but 2008, we had some dry beans that yielded well above 4,000 pounds per acre. And But we've never had anywhere near the root rot issues or the disease problems since we changed our rotation uh, to, to manage that disease. And it just shows us how having more biodiversity on the farm can make quite a difference. Uh, where the, before I go on to this next piece, were there any questions on this? Well, yeah, Carl, I just got a few more here, and, uh, and then we'll have to kind of wrap this up here in a few minutes. There's a question related to uh, kind of back to the clovers that came in. Uh, yep. is, have you noticed the difference between varieties within the red clover that, that as far as being 240 pounds of nitrogen, off a lot of nitrogen, uh, as being one being a more of a end producer than others? Uh, we found that any clover that was, like our medium reds are... Uh, They'll, they'll make two or three cuttings. Uh, they all seem to be pretty equal. I think it has more, it's more important to have uh, medium red clover or to have a clover that's well adapted to where you are than to worry about one variety or another. Uh, I really think we've badly underestimated the nitrogen fixation ability of our legumes. I, I know I had the old textbook that said red clover could make up to 50 pounds of N that could be credited to the crop. And I was, I kind of believed that for a while, and then I started doing my homework. Well, if I, if I grow clover hay, even if it's not a great yield, I'm taking, you know, a pound of, six pounds of protein contains one pound of N. And uh, I've seldom seen clover that didn't make more like 300 or 400 pounds that we could remove in the hay. And I've seen alfalfa produce five or 600 pounds of N just in the form of what's being removed in the hay. So I think some of these textbooks were written by people. These things get repeated over and over, and the way I put it once until some idiot puts it in a textbook without checking, and then it becomes yeah. fact. Yeah, and yeah. I some, sometimes we need to ask questions about some of these things that get repeated. Yeah, and you mentioned a couple of times the soil health testing. What is it you're doing? Okay, the <laughs> soil health testing is an evolving process, and right now – 
of course, there's the Haney test, which uh, uh, NRCS is running, and that's that's more of a way to imitate what a root would find, and a, a way to more direct our synthetic fertilizer amendments. But the Cornell soil health tests are looking for other yield limiting factors. And quite often, we've done such a great job with fertilizer and chemical soil testing that uh, that's seldom the yield limiting factor anymore. So uh, one of the soil health tests that we have had good results with is one I just described. The, 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 they call it the disease suppressiveness test which uh, is done in the lab just uh, by George Valley. Uh, another one is uh, the water holding capacity test. There's a, another test that is done, and this is all part of the, this kind of a battery of tests, just like you test for NPK, boron, sulfur, zinc. You test for all these different factors. Aggregate stability. And this is a test where you take a chunk of soil and you just wash it, and you're measuring how much of the soil will break up and how much will stay in stable aggregates. Uh, this is a really good indicator for soil structure. It's a good indicator for water holding capacity, even though we're measuring it directly. And then there are tests that measure uh, the resistance, how hard the soil is, the resistance to roots. Now, the penetrometer out in the field is okay, but it has a major weakness because that changes with moisture. So in a lab, they're taking this soil and bringing it to a known level of hydration and then doing penetrometer readings, both for the surface and in the deeper layers. You know, these are these are all measures of soil health that directly tie back to your productivity, and they are ways of identifying what is your limiting factor, not just for yield but also for plant health. And once you've identified what those limiting factors are and measured it, then you can start working on improving it. Uh, interesting thing is almost every soil health measure is improved by using cover crops, but some cover crops are better than others, just like I described in the disease suppressiveness. Okay, Carl, we're going we're gonna to about wrap this up. I got two more questions, and those folks are interested in Cornell tests. If you just Google Cornell soil health test, they've got an excellent manual online. You can download and you can read just exactly what what Klaus was talking about, and uh, does a good job of explaining what they are and what to look for. And that and, and you can also uh, has instructions if you want to try and get some of your samples tested. And you had mentioned earlier your quote. I think that's the thing that's visiting, preparing with this that stuck with me is that every crop should follow its most suitable predecessor. Who who was it that made that quote? Because I got people here wanting to Google this oh. guy and find that out. Well, there's his name was uh, Bernard Rademacher, R-A-D-E-M-A-C-H-E-R. And the, the paper, probably his best paper, was printed, was translated into English. This was written in German, but it was translated into English in a journal called Herbage, H-E-R-B-A-G-E. H-E-R-B-E-A-G-E. Herbage, -E. -E. okay. And I think it might have been 1940 or 41. It, the paper itself was written in 39. And uh, I remember for years the old Crafts and Rainer agronomy book, which that tells how old I am. <laughs> was used. And, but it had all these uh, charts that had German varieties on them. Well, they they had been lifted from Rademacher's paper in 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 the weed section in the in the American agronomy book that was used in the 50s and 60s. And I finally found the original source by looking through the bibliography. But uh, eOrganic has this paper translated into English uh, mounted on it. The only problem I've had with eOrganic is it's not a very user-friendly site. But you should be able to get the entire paper at eOrganic. OK. Well, with that, Carl, I'm going to have to cut you off because we've run a little bit past time. And I, again, I, I appreciate your wealth of knowledge and your energy. Uh, I don't know if you've got any closing comments. I might let you go. I know you, you were <laughs> going to make a couple comments there about the, the ragweeds and the chicory, but uh, okay. maybe go, go ahead and do that, and then we'll, yeah. just, we'll have to sign off. Each one of these plants is a specialist. <clears throat> you know, every plant that grows in the soil fits a certain environment, and it can actually, along with the soil health tests, understanding which conditions these weeds are favored by is a soil test in itself and can be used by a manager who's really sharp. And this is the idea of seeing what you're looking at. When you see these weeds, 
maybe, or when you look at these weeds, maybe we should see something telling us that uh, I'm here because the soil is such and such. So it's kind of a parting thought that maybe we could be learning an awful lot from nature just from that concept. Incidentally, this is a picture of a field of buckwheat. It's kind of pretty, but it smells like cat box when they're blooming. <laughs> Well, it sounds like we need to have you back, sir, for a, another hour discussion on that topic, Klaus. And with that, I'm going to have to cut it off. And again, I appreciate uh, your input and your willingness to participate and encourage everybody to continue listening. Uh, we do have another uh, organic and soil health webinar in October. I don't know exactly the date. There will be uh, you folks out there that are on our mailing list. Make sure you watch that or listen and look for that. I believe it's going to be Dr. Christine Nichols, who has just started uh, at the Rodell Institute. We'll be talking a little more about the connection between organic farming practices and improving soil health at that time. And with that, I'm going to say uh, thank you for participating and look forward to you visiting with you in the future. Thanks for having me. Incidentally, that yeah. point in the background is 200